Um, I presented a lot of the information here at CPP Now. Uh, sorry, this is CPP Now. Sorry, at CPP Con uh, last year. And uh, on Friday afternoon, I received a phone call from John, and uh, he asked whether I could fill in at rather the last minute for somebody who had dropped out. And so I'm, this is kind of a performance art piece called What Happens If You Have Five Days to Prepare a New Talk um, and That You Spent the Last Five Days Either Travelling or Attending Other People's Talks, so you haven't really done anything at all. So as the astute of you have already picked out, this, is, this differs from my CPP con talk by the word else. Um, but there are other things that have changed. So the beginning part will be a bit similar to the, the, the CPPCon one, but then we're going to go off and do some other more try exciting and interesting things. So uh, I'm Matt Godbolt, as you probably have already read. Um, this is called, What Else Has My Compiler Done For Me Lately? Unbolting the Compiler's Lid Again. So the outline of this is I'm going to retell the Compiler Explorer story, how it came about, why it exists, uh, I'm going to give a bit of an assembly 101 because most of my slides are full of assembly code, x86 assembly code, which is usually a big turnoff for everyone, but hopefully with this crowd, maybe even redundant for me to go over. But if you don't know x86 assembly, I'll give you a quick overview. And then I'm going to ask, what else has my compiler done for me lately? Uh, when I reviewed this this morning, it occurred to me that this talk is basically my love letter to compiler authors because they do an amazing job. I mean, they take my terrible code and they turn it into something quite beautiful. And oftentimes, I would get to write it any way I like, and the compiler still goes, yeah, I got this. I, you, I'll just do the right thing for you. So it's amazing. But there's, there's still things to learn about looking at what the compiler can and can't do, and maybe some of the hints that you've given it that steer it in the wrong <laughs> direction. So hopefully, some of those things will come out in this talk. Uh, and then at the end, I'm going to do a little behind the scenes about how Compiler Explorer is, is working. and. Um, show maybe a bit of, of, of the scripts that run it and talk a little bit about that. But this is going to be a very interactive thing because I don't think I have an hour and a half's worth of content, so you can help me pad it by asking questions <laughs> as I go. So the backstory. Oh, there's a question. Oh, no. There's a, there's a, there's a spare seat. <laughs> so the question, um, this, the question th that sort of started this was, Around about 2011, when the new standard came out, and like Range 4, for example, came <laughs> on the map for us, um, I was working for a trading company and where performance is like the most important thing that you need to worry about. You know, it's going to be correct, obviously, that's really important. Um, but then the secondary thing is, is the, the performance. And we, um, a colleague and I, were kind of debating back and forth about whether or not you could take code that looks like this, and just for now, the, it's, it's going to be. Sean Parent annoyance um, because there's going to be lots of raw loops in this, so I apologise in advance for all that. But it's, it's here to demonstrate stuff. I will, where possible, use the correct accumulate type stuff as we go, as you'll see. But we, we'd have a piece of code, something like this. We're going to iterate over a vector and we're going to add them all up. Okay, obviously stood accumulate, right? But things like this, and we would say like, this is the old way of doing it. We'd really love to use the shiny new range for, and you would think trivially that that would be equivalent, right? But we'd been bitten before with other languages. We, we'd known that um, in some managed languages, for example, there would be iterators that would be constructed behind the scenes and a lot of back, back, background things, which then means garbage is being created and whatever. And so some, there was some received wisdom in other ca uh, cases of languages that you shouldn't be doing this kind of thing. You have to like iterate over it one by one. But we're like, well, how can we tell? Now, obviously, the right answer is to, um, to benchmark your code and see if it's faster or slower, that kind of thing. But we wanted a sort of more general approach to, well, what can we see if there is a difference between the code before and after? So, you know, I asked the question here, is one better than the other? To me, clearly, the bottom one is better. Well, again, modulo, not actually writing a raw loop in the first place. But the bottom one is much better for me as a programmer to write. Um, but can I afford to do it? So we decided to look at the compiler output and see if we could derive something from that. So. Before I get into all of the horrific <laughs> details of assembly code and all that kind of stuff, there's a giant, giant caveat here. And it, it comes up quite a lot when I get people emailing me asking me about this kind of thing. Um, don't just read the assembly. That's a really sort of rude thing for me to say because we're just going to be reading the assembly all the whole <laughs> way through this talk. You should always, always, always measure too. The compiler is super smart. And if you even if you look at the output and kind of go, well, this is tons more instructions. How on earth could this, uh, this be better than some other approach that I've thought of, um, you need to uh, benchmark it. And I'd recommend heartily 
picking up Google Benchmark, which does a fantastic job of like scaling and getting this type of stuff right. Um, there's also um, a website, quickbench.com, which allows you to, pretty much like Compiler Explorer, dump in some code and just do a quick analysis of how fast it is. So I definitely worth <laughs> looking at that. Um, so that said, we're going to look at assembly. So let's just quickly go over what um, x86 assembly looks like. Um, I'm going to be looking at x86-64 as I'm hoping x86-32 is mostly dead now, although at least one of my laptops at home is still a 32-bit one. Um, how many of you here, actually, before I dive into this, feel would say I'm comfortable reading x86 assembly? Oh, pretty much everyone except Marshall, who's typing. <laughs> <laughs> OK, then we're going to go turbo speed over this. So, you know, we've got a bunch of registers. And the main thing I'm going to point out about this is that the, the arguments to functions come in in RDI and RSI and RDX. And I never remember this. I have this pinted, printed out and stuck to the side of my monitor so I can remember which argument goes where. And that when you return from a function, the caller is expecting you to have put, at least for integer values, your, res resu uh, your result into RAX. Um, and registers go by many names. Um, the 64-bit version of a register is called RAX or RDX or RBX or RCX. And then there are varying different ways which sort of represent almost like the, the sort of mining through the strata of, of you know, 30 years of Intel compatible hardware, you know, starting down here with like something that I recognize from the Z80 programming I used to do, um, up through like a 16-bit version up to the 32-bit version. So you can still refer to all the registers in that way. And when you talk about AX, you're just talking about the bottom 16 bits of the 64-bit racks register. Mm -hmm. Likewise, AH is this bit and AL is that bit. And it's very rare that you'll see this, except when you're talking about Boolean values, and then you might see AL being used. Um, of course, no, it would be lovely to sort of have a very orthogonal design here, but there was a big sort of, um, what should I say, architectural misstep where writing to a AX doesn't affect all of the other bits. And that's great, that's kind of useful, you might think, except at the microarchitectural level, that means that you have to kind of split the register into, into bits and track <coughs> which parts of which register are being invalidated and renamed by different parts of the system. Now, that's, that's, that stuff is a whole other talk, but it, was, it turned out that when they moved to, from 32-bit to 64-bit, AMD decided that when you write to EAX, we're just going to throw away the top 32 bits. And that way, we can do some clever stuff in the register renamer and all that stuff. So you'll, you'll see a lot of stuff where you might otherwise expect racks to be used. You know, I'm returning a 64-bit value. Why is it only doing stuff with EAX? And that's because it knows that the top 32 bits are going to be zeroed. All right, I think I've probably labored that too much. And so on for all the other registers as well. Um, instructions must be uh, presented in Intel assembly syntax, which is the one true way to read instructions. <laughs> Any, yeah? Anyone going to take that one up with me? No? No AT&T fans in? One in the corner, maybe half-heartedly, doesn't want to be... Uh, <laughs> no, no, it's just, I, I grew up with um, like 6502 and Z80 and like they're all like so, uh, dest equals source kind of, you know, you move something in front, uh, move, yeah, this, <laughs> dest comma source. And um, the thing really to note here is that the, for those who aren't, aren't familiar with x86, that these, w at least one of the source operands there and maybe the destination can be this really complicated expression, which is you know, a base, a memory um, um, access, which is a base plus a register offset, plus another register timed by one, two, or four, or eight, which is very, very complicated. And you know, if coming from like a more risky background, as I did from, from ARM, that was like staggering to see how much work one instruction apparently can do. We will return to this um, as we go. Um, so let's just quickly go over a few instructions. Again, I think the room knows what we're doing here. Uh, the only ones I think I'm going to bother pointing out um, here is like, well, obviously this is like um, indexing within an array is pretty straightforward. That's exactly why we have that kind of offset plus a register times one, two, four, or eight. Um, that gives us like an ability to index into an array of, of like ints or doubles or things like that um, in, in within the same instruction. Um, and in fact, the, the addressing system is so powerful that we can actually just have an instruction, this LEA instruction here. Uh, that instruction just says, do the address calculation, but don't do anything else because it's actually really convenient to be able to get the address of something. So here I've written it as uh, the equivalent of this LEA instruction is to kind of take the address of the RBX element of an int array of R, uh, in R14. Um, but really what this is is, a, is a quite a complicated add instruction. And uh, given that x86 unfortunately tends to have just two operands, you know, you do racks plus equals RDI, you've destroyed the old value of racks. Um, oftentimes you want to keep the old value of something around and then add something to it and have like two 
a before and after copy of it. And um, come in, come in. Um, <laughs> And uh, the LEA is one of the few instructions that lets me do that kind of calculation. I can do a bunch of arithmetic over here and then store the results in a different register from the ones that I was using. That's dead convenient. It turns out the compiler uses this a lot. All right, and then the last one, obviously, is the very famous <laughs> Zor register with itself, which seems like the dumbest thing you'd ever want to do. But of course, any number exclusive order with itself yields zero. And you think, well, why would on earth would you bother that? Why not mov edx, comma, zero? And that's because, well, the instructions, first of all, the encoding for the instruction would have to store the, the constant value, which would be four bytes of zero and a mov, however many bytes it takes to say mov. So that's five bytes probably, and that's terrible, whereas the ZOR is much, much smaller. I think it's only one byte. And the second bit is that within the microarchitecture of the chip, um, it's well aware that this is a, a, a trick for getting a zero into a register. And so it just goes, it, does, it knows that it doesn't depend on any previous value of the register. It can make up a whole new register and say, well, sure, here's your new uh, EAX and I've set it to zero for you. And then like a new dependency chain within inside the out of order execution engine can start. So there's, there's a fantastic stack overflow um, answer on this subject. Uh, so in summary, I think we've, we've, we've done all this stuff. Um, yeah, we've covered everything there, yes. All right, so where were we? Yeah, we were looking at these two, th two terrible pieces of code and we were saying which one of these is better from the performance point of view. And so Compiler Explorer version 0.1 was born out of this shell script. In fact, this is not the exact shell script because I had watch at the beginning of this. And I don't know if you know about the Unix uh, tool watch. It just runs the same command over and over again, and you can do dash dash diff and all kinds of stuff. So it's just a pipeline of running the compiler <coughs> against the file, outputting to standard out, piping it through C++ filter to get rid of all the mangled names, and then piping it through a crappy little grep here to get rid of all of the, the sort of like the, uh, the dot file directives and things that weren't really that important for this. Um, I mean, you could pipe it through GDB or get GDB to disassemble it and then and kind of pick out a function as well, that kind of stuff. But this is what it started as. And I would have um, a split screen on my monitor. And on the left-hand side, I'd have this with the watch in it. On the right-hand side, I'd have a VI opening the file. And I would just sit there and tinker with it. And it was really interesting to see. I wonder if we do pre-increment versus post-increment. Does this matter anymore? And you could see that the code was not changing or changing or whatever. So this is what we got out of it. But you know, I went home that night and I thought, well, it's all well and good, but it's not very pretty. What happens when something doesn't look very nice? Do you write a desktop ap application? You know, No, you go to the web. So I hacked up something that evening in Node.js, and <laughs> Compiler Explorer, as we all know it now, was born. And this is the shiny new logo, which is not actually that shiny and new. I have loads of stickers at the front here. Sorry for those on the video. Um, <laughs> but um, they're at the front here, and I've got more <laughs> in my, my, uh, my room. So come and grab me if you want some stickers to adorn your laptops with. Oh, so the question was, when was the very first version? So the first version that I have on the public repo, I think is in 2012 sometimes, like June 2012, I think. But I then found the internal um, repo where I'd, I'd originally started at, uh, at my company, and there was a few before that. Yeah, take as many as you like, John. I've got loads of those. Uh, you, s you steal those, mate. Uh, um, taking advantage of coming in late and stealing the, getting the best seat in the house. Uh, so yeah, here we are. I think this is familiar to you all. And on the left-hand side, obviously, we have the code. On the right-hand side, we have the assembly. And this is a kind of an advertisement for one of the features I have, or an advertisement. Sorry, I don't know what happened to me there. I'm starting to go native. Um, for the embedded view, which I think some of you use. I know, Jason, you've used this to some extent. It's a great way of destroying your web browser if you have more than about five or six of these things in, because this is an iframe with the whole site in it and um, some things to make it save a bit of space. But you can embed this. So if you go up to the little sherry link thing on the top right-hand corner, and there's a drop-down as well, you can pick like embed link, and it'll give you an iframe piece of HTML to paste in to have something as beautiful as this. But uh, it's not actually that useful, is it? So I am going to make the cameraman's life more difficult by moving around. And I'm going to actually open this up on the real Compiler Explorer, which is actually the one running on my laptop. Um, and so obviously, you guys probably all know this, that you know, the, the coloration here is my attempt to read the debug information that the compiler emits and then link the source code with the destination on the right-hand side. And you know, we've got some features like you can mouse over and get some, oh, the zoom is not helping me here for, for this, but you, know, you can get some information about the instructions. As you mouse over it, it's pretty subtle, but you are actually, it is highlighting on the right-hand side the, the code and vice versa. As you go over here, it should be highlighting the equivalent code on the other side. And there is a keyboard shortcut somewhere. I can never remember this, Control F10, which will like 
highlight it if you've got a big um, document on both sides. And we've got loads of these funny little buttons up the top here, which um, essentially everyone should just leave the defaults. Um, but if you really want to see all the horrendous stuff that's hiding away, that Compiler Explorer is doing its job to try and get rid of and hide from you, then you can turn off some of these filters. Um, while we're here, I might as well just do a quick slide of new things that have occurred since the uh, CppCon talk. Um, we now have support for libraries, and we have a whole... Oh, we actually, no, we did have them, because, of course, Titus, we put Absail in it, uh, actually, at CppCon. So there are loads and loads of libraries here. If your favorite library is not in this list, then send me a pull request. And um, there's, a, there's a, in the documentation, there is a how to add a library, and you just do a two or three things, and you can get your library in here, provided it, it works best for header-only libraries. If it needs to be built and stuff, that gets complicated. Um, because I'm running locally, I actually get this, this little ADA out thing here, which is the primitive beginnings of the execution support that everybody wants. But I'm not gonna even going to show you how bad it is right now. But you can pull the code down yourself and see, and I'll show you how to do that at the end. Um, let me make sure I've got rid of all of those things. We're back to work. Okay, so what was the question? That's right. Um, <laughs> what difference does this make if, uh, if I change this to be like a range for? So the way that I'm going to do this is I'm going to bring down another editor. And this is, again, another way of me trying to expose some of the features that people can't see because my user experience is um, or UX design is just dreadful. So there's not many, many things that are uh, discoverable. So here I've just made a new editor window. And at the moment, you'll notice it's not colorized in any way because nothing's compiling the code in this window right now. But the default view obviously has one editor and one compiler linked to it. And I'm going to add a new compiler over here. So now I've got two copies of the piece of code being co compiled, and I am going to just paste in the options here. We're, we're using GCC 8.1 here for what it's worth. Um, for most of these examples, will be GCC. Um, we'll do some clan comparisons as we go when, it, when, it's, uh, when I know there are interesting things to, to note. Um, and so I'm going to change this bottom one now to be auto i over v. I'm going to have to remember to make sure this is i. As are all integers. And OK, so something changed here. And you could kind of scroll up and down here, or you could fiddle around with the windows and try and get them next to each other. Or you could bring up a diff view. And I'm going to bring the diff view here, and then I'm going to maximize it. All right, so now we get to see the before and the after, which is really, really handy when it's as small as this. Now, of course, in this particular case, I knew that it was going to be a relatively small diff. Most of the time, this is not actually that useful of you because you just get thousands and thousands of lines. You know, once, once it starts getting out of step, then it doesn't get that interesting. But for little snippets like this, this is perfect. So we can see that the preamble, a little bit of preamble, the first couple of instructions are the same in both cases. Then it diverges. But the really critical and interesting part here is that the loop, without even like diving into too much what it's doing, this loop here, this L3, is identical on both sides. So whatever crazy transformations have gone, inside, gone on inside the compiler have amounted to the same piece of code. That's kind of cool. Now, you could probably just say, this is fine right now. We don't even have to dig any further because I'm assuming that most of the work when I'm summing over a big array of things is in the loop. So they're the same. Um, it's worth also noting, before I go too much further, let me close this off, that I've got it on um, O2 here. This is GCC on O2. And I will show you why it's O2, and which is sort of unfair because the code, genera code generator is much cleverer than this. Once we put O3 on, then it becomes very much harder, harder to reason about what it's doing, and certainly for the for like a sort of stand-up chat kind of a way. But it's using all these cool, funky instructions in here, um, so it's doing like you know vectorization and stuff. And and actually, while we're here talking of Clang, let's put it on O2, and I'll just show you Clang on O2. This is trunk Clang. Just does this straight off the bat. I mean, look at that crazy stuff. It's amazing. Clang loves to unroll stuff, and it's unrolled. There's these these. Um, it's just amazing. Anyway, we'll talk more about that later. <laughs> So while we're here, let's answer the other question um, before I go a little bit into what the code is doing. Let's go back to GCC 8.1. And let's see whether or not, all right, let's, oh, I deleted the other one, didn't I? Darn it. OK, hang on. Let me just do auto v over oh, i over v. <laughs> and then put i. And then we're going to paste this into another editor window. Sorry, I forgot my little patter. Um, you can see uh, there's a little sneaky setup thing there that kind of auto hides that I'm trying to not show you. Um, and so this guy, I'm going to do return accumulate of begin oh, live coding for the win. End of end of v comma zero. All right, and then the indentation is not all that clever. And we'll get a quick compiler for this here. Steal the command line arguments, and then 
let's do our diff again, which is what I was supposed to do last time. And so this is the difference between the std accumulate version and the raw loop. And you can see it's nothing. It's just the order of which where it reads things from. So that's pretty amazing. You know, that's a very high level abstraction compared to like me writing it myself and the right thing happens, which is what we want to happen. But again, it's those compiler writers and library authors that, that do all the hard work so that we can write lazy code and the compiler just makes it good. OK, so I'm going to do a super quick walkthrough of what that code was doing just to sort of put it into context so we can see what the difference is and why the, the, the preamble was different between the two. So the first thing to note, obviously, is that we're passing a single parameter to our, our function. And so we're getting a, a, reference, a const reference to a vector of ints. Now, at the assembly level, of course, a reference is a pointer. There's no difference between the two of them. And so the first thing we're doing is we're reading the a, a, through the pointer the first eight bytes and then the second eight bytes. Now, intuitively, one might think that that's reading out the first like integers from the array. But of course, a vector isn't really the array of, of, of integers. It is a container that then points on to the array of integers. And so what we're doing here is we're actually looking at the, the implementation here. We can see that the, what a vector has is uh, three pointers. So if you look at the size of a vector, it's, um, uh, uh, I can't do math in my head. 24? 24? 24? S eight, 16? Yes, 24. So it's three pointers worth. And we've got a pointer to the beginning of the uh, vector storage, so where the ints are living. We've got a pointer to where the end is. And we've got the pointer to the end of storage, as the vector could actually be bigger than we're currently using. So what we're doing here is we're getting begin and end. Cool. All right. Seems quite reasonable. And then this is where we diverge. And on the left-hand side, I've got the traditional version. On the right-hand side, I've got the range version. So in the traditional version, what's happening here is we're subtracting n from begin, and then we're dividing it by 4 by shifting it right by 2. What's that? That's getting the size. You know, we, we, we said that's what we're doing. We're for i equals 0, i is less than size plus plus i as we go over the vector. So the compiler has actually generated the code for the size. And then what is it doing with the size? Well, it's not actually doing anything directly with the value of the size. It's only using this JE instruction. So it knows that having calculated the size, and in order to do so, it's done a divide by uh, 4. It's shifted it down. The flags are left over as if it would be, had been compared with 0, effectively. And so we can say, well, if there's no work to do, JE, then we're done here. We're gonna, this L4 loop is off at the end, and we're going to return 0. Brilliant. Otherwise, there's some things to do. And so what do we do? Well, we add RCX to RDX. Well, hang on a second. That's the exact opposite of what happened at the top here. What's happened is the compiler has basically destroyed the value of one of the things it needed, uh, one of the end of the begins, and then it's reconstituting it again down here. So now it's got the end of the array again. Hmm, seems like wasteful. Um, we'll come back to that in a second. On the other side, effectively what that range for uh, comes out is, is something like this, where we just stash the begin and end by getting this begin and end of um, calling the std begins to the end. And then we're just going to use an iterator that just starts at the, the begin iterator and just keeps incrementing it until it hits the end iterator. So what the code is doing is this EAX, incidentally, is going to be where our result is going to be stored. So that's what we're going to be adding into, accumulating into. So all we're doing here is, is begin equals equal to end. And if it is, we're done. So that's effectively the, for, the first iteration of the for loop being done, like the, 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 the check here to say whether or not we have any work at all to do. There's no need to call size, and there was no need to like destroy end and reconstitute it. So then we get to the loop, and I'm not even going to go into the details of this, but effectively we're just going to start with that first pointer and keep walking it forward until the end. The interesting thing here is, of course, in the original case, we were using an, an index, an array index, and we were just walking element by element. And the compiler has gone and transformed that into started getting a pointer to the first object and then walking that pointer forwards which is essentially what we're doing in the iterating version, where we're actually getting a pointer explicitly and doing it. So my best theory to all of the stuff that's going on in the traditional side here is that there's the various transformations that allow uh, an iteration over a range of elements in an, in, in an array just come up with this sort of solution. It's like, well, we know where the end is. We know how many elements we've got here, and we now need to move it up towards the end so that now I've got the end pointer, and then I'm sort of doing it. So it's kind of lost somewhere along the lines where the, they already had end somewhere else before, and it's rederiving it. But the long and the short of it is they're equivalent, right? We've probably two or three cycles at the beginning. Even for me as an HFT person, I'm not going to quibble about that. But as it is, the, the, the good one was the one that was better for me to write in the first place. So that's really, really, really pleasing. And we'll see that it has even better side effects a bit later on. So um, yeah, just well, this is for more for me to remind, remember to have done these things. So yeah, the optimizer settings obviously are super important. 
Um, I didn't actually say, but one of the other arguments that I have up there was setting the architecture to Haswell, which is a somewhat contemporary processor. Um, and standard accumulate generates the right code, and you should be using that at all times. <laughs> all right, so this is the what has my compiler done for me lately. Now, given that I think most of you, how many of you saw the CPPCon version of this? OK, it's about half. All right, we have some time. I am going to go and do this in the opposite order. I'm going to go straight to what else has my compiler done for me lately. And if, uh, if we don't get time to finish all of these and go back, then just go and watch the CPPCon one. OK, so now we're into some sort of experimental things that I'm going to hopefully, you guys are going to start shouting at me, no, that's not true, or something like that, um, and, or, and or help me discover what exactly is going on in here. I haven't had as much time as you now know. Um, so this is us taking the original piece of code, the classic going over in the worst way, you know, like iterating one at a time, and then we're just calling some func. So instead of just it, um, adding up every element in the array, we're going to pass that to some function that we don't even know what it is, I'm just literally declaring it up the top here. And Compiler Explorer will obviously doesn't actually link unless you ask it to. So you can, with, with free abandon, you can make up any functions you don't really want to tell it and then, um, and then call them anyway, and it'll emit the code for it. So what, what does the compiler know about some func? It knows its signature. It knows its signature. Does it know anything else? That it, what does some, some func do? No, nothing at all, right? So. What, what does that mean for this code? Well, let's have a look on the right-hand side about what, what has happened here. So the, broadly, the, um, and some of the register names have changed because it's trying to use registers that it doesn't have to preserve when it's calling an unknown function. But the, this whole block at the bottom, after call some func, we've got the one add here, which is adding into the current accumulated value. Again, now, now the accumulated value can't live in EAX because that's what the function we're calling is using. We're going to use R12 to accumulate it. But then there's this giant chunk at the bottom. And this looks sort of strangely familiar. If you recognize from the, the few slides ago, we're reading from, we're presuming RBP points at the vector. We're reading begin of the vector again, and we're reading end of the vector. We're doing a subtraction, and we're doing a shift, and then we're comparing. Oh, so can anyone tell me what's going on here? Uh, it's not able to tell that some funk can't modify the delimited information. Correct. So the, the observation there was that the, the compiler has to be extremely um, uh, conservative about what some func has done, even though it's a const ref to a vector, that's const to us, but not to anybody else. For all I know, some func has some also has a reference to that vector, and it's modified, it's pushed things onto it or popped it. So it has to be hugely conservative. And whereas before, it had hoisted v dot size out of the loop, and then afterwards it went, well, given that I'm iterating a certain number of times over, I can, use, I can now walk my pointer forwards. Now it can't do most of those optimizations, so we've suddenly got this huge pessimization. Now, Let's go and have a quick look at what happens when we start fiddling with the code. Please work. Yes, good. All right, so there's a lot more code in here, but there's the L3. This is the bit that's really pertinent. So the first thing to do and, um, is the obvious thing. If it knows what x does, then two things can happen. Right? One, it can inline it so that it doesn't make a function call at all, and now suddenly it can use all the registers that it otherwise would have had to have preserved, which is awesome. And two, it's gone back to doing the good thing about, you know, um, finding the pointers at the beginning and the end and just walking through the array and not having to do any other cal calculation. So that's great. Now, of course, we would have got the same effect, or very nearly the same effect, if I'd have, you know, again, something, something has to accumulate. Um, but if I'd have done for auto i over v, some func of i, and in this case, we get the sa roughly the same piece of code. And why is that? Go, Peter. That's correct. So the, 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 the observation is the expansion of the, the range for it caches the begin and end explicitly outside of the loop. So that's great, because now we aren't getting all of these, um, these strange calculations going on. But it's actually worth re remembering, because if some funk was actually pushing values onto the vector, however dreadful that was, we're not going to notice them. Or it, worse still, if it's going to actually remove things from that vector, we might walk off the end of it. So, you know. Uh, yes. Yes, that's a very good point. So the observation there was, or if, if the iterators, the begin and the end iterators, were invalidated because some func actually caused the vector to grow or shrink or in otherwise be, yeah, very good point. So there's a sort of subtle, spooky action at distance here, which is a good reason not to do this kind of thing. Um, another thing you might want to do, if you're horrible and like to torture compilers like me, 
is to start playing around with things that aren't part of the standards. So I'm, uh, you can really, really uh, know that this is not something I recommend, but this is the kind of thing that the compiler, if the compiler can derive this information through some mechanism, so for example, maybe it can't see some func, maybe it doesn't want to inline some func, but maybe during a link time optimization pass, it sees the annotations for some func. It says, well, I'm going to call that function, but I know that it's pure. And knowing that it's pure means I know that it can't possibly modify that V. And so by me naughtily giving it the attribute of pure, even though we have no idea what some func does, then obviously, um, we're still calling the function, we're still using the um, uh, registers that are less convenient than um, just using EAX directly, but we're not doing this crazy calculation. So mm -hmm. there's a whole bunch of things to think about. So just remember that calling an arbitrary function, unless you can see the body, or rather unless the compiler can see the body of that function, either because it's defined in the header or because link time optimization exposes it to it, is effectively like saying all bets are off, you have to go and, and, and recache a lot of information, potentially doing expensive <laughs> pre-computation. So that's, that's kind of an interesting thing. Oh, sorry, I thought well, no, yeah. you, you carry on breathing, please. <laughs> <laughs> it's very important to continue on breathing. Okay, and then this is the, to make um, some of us who might be more inclined to use std accumulate happy. Um, this is my, I think my equivalent of it in std accumulate. Um, so here I've had to pass a lambda for the, the thing that does the accumulation. The left hand thing is the, the story so far and the right hand thing and here's the new object. So I'm calling some func on the new object. <coughs> I'm not sure if this misses out the first element in some way. No, because the first element will be the zero that I'm passing in. I'm just, I'm, wait, I'm looking and there are, there are faces there. Thank you, thumbs up is what I was looking for. <laughs> and so, and you can see that again, the right thing has been done here. Um, the, uh, again, the, if some func was modifying the, the, the vector, we'd fall over all the things we were, we were falling over before, but it, it's, you know, you stood accumulate. All right, next, aliasing. This is possibly the worst piece of slide code you've ever seen in your life, and it's not even very, um, it doesn't necessarily demonstrate the point that I want to make that well, so, you, but you get to see it anyway. <laughs> so this is a, an API where you pass a, to a function, you're passing it an array, and you pass it the first element and how many there are, and it's going to return to you the sum of them, all, all of them, until it hits a zero. Why you would ever want to do this is beyond me, but it kind of proved my point. And then because we've got two output parameters, I mean, a theme of this so far at this, this conference has been, you know, like, don't use output parameters and stuff, and I wholeheartedly, and you'll see why in a second, um, agree with that. You know, you're still in the world where maybe I'm just going to pass references to objects and let the caller fill them in. And then, you know, you're going to say, so I'm going to put the sum in this output here, and then I'm also going to update num with the position where I found the zero. So it's, again, terrible. You'd never do this right. But you know, once you've started putting out parameters in, sure, let's just put out parameters everywhere, and then maybe this could return a bool whether I succeeded or not, or something like that. But <laughs> anyway, I think I've fluffed enough around that. Quick question: Is it intentional that you have int star first and it's not const? Uh, the, qu the observation was: Is it intentional that I have int star first and it's not const? Uh, no, it's not intentional. Um, I don't think. I think on a later slide it is const. Actually, now I remember. But thank you for observing. I don't think it makes any difference in this context. Because I saw the potential for three upper terms. I see. Yes, I understand. Yeah. <laughs> yes, the first here is actually referring to the beginning of an array, and it should be a const int star. Thank you, John. So, um, I mean, you look on the right-hand side here, and there's a, an explosion of code here, mainly because we've got this conditional bailout in the middle. The thing I want you to see about this is the fact that because we're writing to this sum parameter, and we're also reading from this first array, there is no, the compiler can't tell whether or not f the, this num, or sorry, this sum thing, is actually one of the entries in the very array that we're running over, which would be Terrible, of course, but <laughs> is, that, is that a question or? Could you add restrict to that? We might be coming to that. Um, <laughs> the observation was, could we add a restrict to that? Um, yes. Yeah, so anyway, we've got first, we've got num, and we've got this sum thing. And, and so here what's happening is that instead of keeping all of the intermediate values in this loop in registers, and then at the end, <laughs> flushing them out to memory, we're having to update memory as we go, just in case um, we're modifying something that we're then going to read back later on. And obviously that's not ideal. So yes, let's have a look at what happens if we start doing some of the things. Actually, you know, I think that's later on. You can tell how well rehearsed this is, right? I mean, if, if I look confused at seeing these slides, it's because this is only the second time I've seen some of these slides. So, <laughs> <laughs> um, so I think actually, you know, what do I do here? I think the first thing to do here is to do, is to do away with the aliasing entirely and just say, well, look, let, why don't we just return the sum? That would make it far more sensible. So if we do this and do int sum here, and then return sum at the end, 
I haven't got any warnings on which is why it's actually compiling. And then we look at the, the loop here. Now, the little part here, the L3 and L4, um, there's no memory accesses other than the one up here, which is actually reading from the array in the first place. So I think we'll let it do that. That seems completely reasonable. So that's obviously a much better API, right? No, no. So, of course, the, the receive wisdom have I got it here? Yes, alternative implementation. The receive wisdom really is to do something like return a tuple or return a result structure. And like in general, I think returning names things in a structure certainly suits me better, especially when they're both ints. I mean, will it, is the sum the first one or the second one? And, you know, it's, it's much, much better. And you know, it's so easy to write now. So if we do this, even though I'm constructing the result that I'm going to return, and then I'm actually updating that result rather than like keeping it in temporary variables and then uh, the, at the end constructing a result and returning it like as return result of some comma num. Um, uh, and the main reason that I'm doing that is because even within this loop here, I can't remember if the first one is the sum or the second one is the sum and the first one's the non-zero. So if I do this, I get to do r dot sum plus equals and there's no ambiguity at all. Um, the compiler is still smart enough to enregister these things, and if there's a fancy struct, SRO, A, 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 I'm looking, does there someone with compiler knowledge know that what this is called? No. There's a thing for like destruct, effectively taking a structure, destructuring it to registers, and then like bump, dumping it out afterwards. Struct something to array. Yeah. <laughs> That's some, maybe something like that, yeah. All right, anyway. LLVM calls it. Okay, thank you. LLVM calls it SROA. SRO. Yeah. That's, I knew I'd seen the acronym, but, uh, acronym, and I couldn't remember quite what it stood for, but. Um, Scalar replacement of aggregate, yes. That may, this may not be this, so please you know, write in and tell me. Um, <laughs> Thank you, who? And then we can see another interesting thing here, and that's that we're looking at this return. This is where the actual return's happening, and that structure um, is being packed into a single register anyway. What we're happening here is we're shifting up one of the two um, parts, like the last non-zero, we're shifting it up 32, oring it into the sum and returning it back out. So like, you know, there's, almost, there's no RVO type stuff going on here, as, as you might imagine, as was described by one of the lightning talks. Who was it? It was, it was John, wasn't it? John Cowell last night. You know, showing how like some clever stuff to do with stack management was done. This is, no, no, we can just return this in a register, which is awesome. And one of the most powerful things about C++, which I'll talk about in my lightning talk um, tomorrow, uh, so that's all well and good. So I think that that's, that's better. Um, but let's talk about aliasing two of two. Here is another maybe somewhat more um, sensible thing. Um, and there's probably sh missing a const here as well, John, I think, at least one of these things. But we are updating x in this case. What I'm doing is I'm saying run through x and y. There's 65,000 doubles in x and y. Um, and I'm saying, you know, make the x1 the max of x and y in a very terrible way on purpose, obviously. And if we look at the beginning of max array, we see this code. And there's nothing analogous. What we're doing here is we're doing sort of this LEA. We're sort of saying add 32 to one of the parameters. So this is RDI, this is RSI. Now look at the, the, the destination plus 32, compare it with the first thing. And if it's not, go somewhere. There's nothing like that in here. Can anyone hazard a guess as to what's going on there? Titus, maybe? Yeah, go on. It's checking to see if the ranges overlap, or at least in 32-bit byte windows they overlap, because what's it going to do? <coughs> it would like to do lots of these very cool and funky instructions that like to do things many, many elements at a time. And that's great, but if it's going to read 32 bytes worth of input and then write, and 32, sorry, 32 bytes of X and 32 bytes of Y, do some kind of com parallel comparison and move and thing and then store it back, those two regions had better not be overlapping. Otherwise, all hell's gonna break loose. And so obviously we've got a lot of work <coughs> at the beginning of the routine here, which is probably fine, you know, your branch predictor, if you, if you, never, if you never intend to pass overlapping regions and you want to express somehow that these regions don't overlap, you know, it's not gonna kill you. The branch predictor is going to learn this. It's never going to go that way. But you know, there's a lot of code that's been unnecessarily generated down here to handle the cases where they overlap. Um, well, lots of code. All right, a tiny bit of code. Um, and you know, it would be lovely if I could somehow promise to the compiler that these regions do not overlap. And now, this is where the horrific restrict keyword, or du rather un double underbar restrict, which is not standard C. It's not even very well defined what it means in the context of C, but suits my purposes here. So I'm going to do this. And interestingly, this is something I noticed a few minutes ago. If I mark one of these things as restrict, what restrict is hand-wavingly is meant to say is, I'm promising you that this doesn't alias with anything else important. But 
the devil is in the detail as to what is important and whether it means it can alias with something which is or is not restrict and I'm not qualified to say what it really means, but I know that it does something quite interesting. So that's, that's what we're talking about here. If I make both of them restrict, you'll see that those checks have gone and we're just jumping straight to L3 and we're straight in with the, the you know, 32 byte magic um, SSE, or sorry, uh, AVX instructions. So that's fun. But if we look at what Clang does, first of all, Clang does a really cool job of unrolling everything because Clang loves to unroll everything. I only have to mark one of them as restrict and it's like, okay, cool, if this doesn't alias, then I don't have to check either, which is quite of an interesting difference from GCC. <laughs> I don't know why that is, but it's an interesting observation. But again, don't rely on restrict here. If you can, the best way to try and do this is to make sure that those two things that come in are of different <coughs> types. And then the, the type-based alias analysis can determine that they're not the same. Of course, that's rather difficult when really you, what you, the type of it is uh, 65,000 doubles, which is the same thing, but you could perhaps come up with a reason to, to call them different things. I don't know if there are any other ideas for like trying to explain to the compiler that those things don't overlap. Nobody? Okay, that's the best we've got. Um, there are some other compiler extensions that we can do. Um, I don't think it matters for doubles, but with some of the other cases, um, you can mark things as saying, like, I know the alignment of this stuff. Like, I'm, I'm promising you that the alignment of this, these, th this data is on, like, a 64-byte boundary so that you can use some of the non- um, unaligned instructions to move from. But I, I think here it's actually generating, on Haswell, I don't think there's enough of a significant penalty for reading stuff unaligned for <laughs> it not to generate it. Um, but I have a second version, which is better. So you saw that there's an if statement in here, which meant that what it really had to do is read in all of X and then read in all of Y, and then do like a parallel compare. And so it does a, an element by element compare. And the result of that is a mask, which says which ones pass the test, and which ones don't pass the test. And then it would do like a, a, a masked move where it kind of inserted the x values that passed the test in the right place and then that would be the answer which is cool but it's a lot of work what we really want to do what we're actually doing of course is the clue is in the name is max array we're actually doing a max and if i phrase it as a max oh this is spinning terribly <laughs> with the old classic and okay stood max would probably be better here um the compiler is again is smart enough to notice that this this operation here is a max operation and it will use the instruction which actually does a max and I was actually su somewhat surprised that um, Clang didn't automatically do this, given that I'm sort of writing back to memory every time anyway. And I'm, so I'm looking at you at the back there. <laughs> you're, all right, all right. <laughs> you're, you're my proxy for Clang type people. Oh, there's another uh, LLVM person there, I believe. What happens if you put stood max there? That's a very good question. Thank you. M uh, Marshall asks, what happens if you put stood max here? Um, first of all, you have to remember which header stood max is in. Is it numeric or algorithm? algorithm. OK. <laughs> Because accumulates in numeric, right? <laughs> because accumulate isn't an algorithm, of course. Uh, stood max of x, i, y, i. Does that look right to everybody? And the exact same code, which is great. As you'd expect, though, so use the libraries. That's what they're there for. Uh, what's next? Heap elision. What was the sorry the question? Oh, yes. Let's just go back and we'll have a look at Clang. So let's go, it was the better one, and sorry, I've lost that now. Let's go include algorithm, no, yes, algorithm. See, I can't even remember, th oh, this, is this has got the restricts on as well. I'll leave those there for now. Um, no, this is stood max, uh, stood max x, i, y, oops, i. Okay, so we've got that there, and let's see what Clang does. My prediction is it's unrolled at 25, th probably the whole lot. I bet you there's no loop, yep. Oh, no, there is a loop there, <laughs> but, <laughs> oh, but it's, 32 at a time. Yeah. yeah, but, yeah, it is, 32 actual things, th 32 doubles at a time, yeah, that's awesome. Did, did it simulate Duff's device? Uh, did it, sorry, what? Did it simulate Duff's device? Did it, it hasn't simulated Duff device, no, because it knows the exact number of iterations, so it, it divides into 32. It's already done it, so did it a compile time? It's, right? yes, yeah, absolutely. Um, what was, there was definitely something I was going to do here, I can't remember <coughs> what it was. Oh, blast. Um, it'll come to me later on and then it'll be too late. Never mind. <laughs> yeah, damn it. I, that was something clever. All right. So this is something which has been touched on by other prominent um, members of the C++ community who like to just demonstrate cool things in the... I'm looking at you, Jason. Um, <laughs> heap elision. So, uh, Matt, just a question. Yes, yeah, certainly. If you make it branch-free in your code, does it make any difference? If I make it branch-free in my code... Um, does it make any difference? So define branch free for me. <laughs> All right, that's a rabbit hole that I don't want to get into, but uh, 
say y minus x, uh, y greater than x multiplied by y, uh, something like that. My, my guess, and we, I mean, we, we, why, how much time we've got? 43 minutes. This yeah, is it perfect. No, 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 this is good. <laughs> It's almost like this website was designed to answer the exactly these kinds of questions. <laughs> so we're going to take x is x i is greater than y i, and then we're going to multiply that by. Uh, well, let's let's try. Oh gosh, live coding. So I'm going to do what like bool greater than or. I oh know it needs to be a float though, doesn't it? Is that going to work? Can I multiply a double by a float? Oh dear me. X i times greater. But I need to kind of get one minus it, don't I, for the other one? Uh, yeah, I, yeah, yeah. yeah, okay. I, rather than you, you look at me and, and, and wish you, your hands were on the keyboard and not mine, I, I will we'll leave that for another time. But I, I, my guess is that, that those kinds of idioms are the kind of things the compiler knows better than you and will undo for you. Much like some of the things that I, if we have time, I'll go back over some of the more fun ones from, from CppCon, and there's some great ones that the compiler goes, <laughs> yeah, don't do that, I'll do it for you. <laughs> I know better than you. All right. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely, yeah. So the, the, the observation is like, it's nice to imagine that the compiler is laughing its, itself at your, your att pitiful attempts to write uh, good code. So, you know, what are we doing here? We're doing something completely pointless. We're going to allocate an int in co uh, of 42, and we're going to allocate an int of 24, and we're going to return star A plus star B, the most pointless thing you would ever want to do. But, you know, you can imagine code paths where that ends up happening. And GCC um, does exactly what we asked it to, which surprised me greatly. <laughs> and if, even if we go to like trunk build, which is one I built this morning, GCC trunk. Oh, top tip, by the way, you can hit delete or backspace if you clicked in this thing here, and you can actually search in here. So the thing I type most often is the word trunk, and then I get clang and GCC. Um, same thing happens here, which is, you know, is valid, but it actually does the add, I think. Is there, is there, a, is there an add in there somewhere? Oh, no, there are 40. No, there's the 42. Where's the EAX? EAX, come on, EBP, LEA, RDX, plus it's actually doing the ad. This is on 02. Make it 03, yeah. All right, make it 03. Let's, this, this one goes up to 011. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, this one goes to 11. And uh, no, apparently not. I mean, I think it used to. But uh, the story here, though, is that the, the bright sparks at Clang, I believe, I mean, I don't know. <laughs> I believe that the side effects of operator new and operator delete have been, it's, it's been defined something like if, if the compiler doesn't think that the, de the operator new or operator delete has been overridden in any meaningful way, then it has no other side effects other than allocating and deallocating memory. Then, although there is an observable side effect, which is that if you had run out of memory that the first construction would have thrown or destroyed, done whatever, um, they're allowed to pretend that that didn't happen. Like the as if rule is sort of slightly relaxed for that particular case. Which does have a surprising consequence because if you have, if, if it doesn't notice that you've like globally overridden operator new and you've done printf, hey, I did an allocation, then you know obviously you're not going to count the same number of allocations. But I think we would prefer this <laughs> than the really, really obscure thing I just described. So that's pretty cool. Um, I don't think it does it for make shared. Oh, I've not, well, this is uh, live, live does it. Let's have a look. Oh, uh, but if you're using shared pointer, you're probably doing it wrong. I mean, I, uh, I mean, if you're using unique pointer here, you're definitely doing it wrong anyway. Peter. Uh, should always be able to know that you're not replacing the new, oper uh, the new uh, uh, global operator new at load time. That's my, yeah, that's my thought. So the observation was it should only know that global operator new is being defined, is being replaced like at link time, right? Uh, or at load time even, yeah. Load time because it could be in a shared library. Low time because it could be in a shared library. Titus, are you just hands up in? Uh, just oh no, you are. <laughs> I, I and there is a whole like wishy-washy like yeah, this as if is not really as if is not correct. Right. In the same. Yeah, this is um, this is the kind of thing that uh, in the C plus plus fourteen time frame we were talking about the dynaray. Right. Was where if you had a local variable of type dynaray and the compiler could do lifetime analysis on it and uh, discover that no references or iterators to this thing <coughs> actually escaped the local mm -hmm. scope, 
then it didn't have to allocate things on your heap in right. order to use, to use Alabeth, for example. Right. So I'm just going to summarize for the purposes of the viewers at home. Um, Titus pointed out that the sort of, and, and, and Marshall have basically sort of come up with, uh, said that uh, the, the movement sort of around C14 is that like observable side effects that such as this can be relaxed where it makes sense for this kind of stuff to happen. Like Marshall mentioned Dynaray, if, if the compiler can prove that Dynaray, nothing from the Dynaray leaks from the scope, then it can use allocate to get the storage or maybe not even get the storage at all, that kind of thing. Um, and, and Titus saying other, other aspects that. Um, that, that we're sort of leaning towards the, the, the number of copy, <laughs> copies that actually happen may not actually match. If, if, if it's more efficient to like elide copies, then why not, why, 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 uh, why not um, avoid doing the copy at all? Um, the heap is, yes, I mean, uh, th sorry, the, the observation there was the heap is expensive, and I think it is, uh, different levels of expense for different people, but that's probably a whole other different talk. Um, and I don't want to go down that road just now, although I agree with you. <laughs> okay. Some other time. So the other cool and neat <coughs> tricks that the compiler can do, this is possibly more in the line with the thing that you were talking about, like avoiding a branch, is like I, I just happened upon this little snippet here, and it's like the ternary operator here was saying, if i is less than zero, then for whatever reason, I'm going to return one, two, three, four, else I'm going to return five, six, seven, eight. And the compiler's like, that smells like a branch to me, and branches aren't much good. And we have conditional move instructions, and they have issues, but this is another way of doing the same thing. What we're doing here is we're taking the input value here, we're moving it into EAX, we're then shifting it right 31 times. <coughs> and what does that mean? 31 copies Peter. Of, of sign bit. We get 31 copies of the sign bit. We're, every time we shift it down, when it's an arithmetic shift, we're going to preserve that sign bit. So that sign, oh, no, this is, yeah, th yes, we are doing that. So the, the, the sign bit moves down into bit 30, and then we shift it down again. And, that, and so we're basically smearing from the top down the sign bit. And so if it was negative, we end up with all ones. And if it was positive, we end up with all zeros. That's a kind of cool <laughs> thing to use, right? Because what we're going to do is use it as a mask. And we're now going to end it with minus 4444. Four, four, four. So the results of this will be either minus 4444 four, 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 or zero, depending on whether the i originally was negative or not. And then we're adding 5678 to that, which means we're either going to get 5678 mi pl minus 4444 four, four, four is 1234, four, <laughs> I hope. Or not. Isn't that cute? And it's the kind of thing that I used to love handcrafting in assembly, and then you know, you'd know you forget to change the magic constants or whatever. It just happens for free because someone clever put it in the compiler for you. Thank you, compiler writers. Quick question, is that property of the minus one, is that something that is not standard across all platforms, or is it specific to this platform? So the question is if the property of minus one... The minus one, the, the, the negative sign bit can be propagated through, but we know that the, the shift for an unsigned is, is zero. Right. Do we know that the shift is minus so, I think the point you're making is like there are a number of undefined behaviors to do with. It's, it's either undefined or unspecified or some. Like right. The, the compiler, of course, knows the platform that it's working on and is allowed to take advantage of the exact exactly. processor you're running on. So, it knows that it can oh, shift so. down and take advantage of that. But in general, if you were to write potentially the same piece of code manually, <laughs> you might be taking advantage of unde undefined behavior yourself unwittingly. Did you have a point on that? Just, okay, we're good. We're good. All right. Let's get on to some C++, because so far this has all been C, pretty much. You know, give or take a vector here or there. So let's write some, some virtual methods. Now, I am old school. I still quite like old school object orientism. Anyone else? No? I am, oh, one, okay, so another one, two-ish. All right, there are, th there are three brave souls in the room. It's not all about stuffing everything into context for a template hell, hell in header files, you know. Oh, oh I'm getting some evil look. Wow, the crowd turns on me. <laughs> um, so, virtual calls are things, right? And, you know, what is a virtual call? It is a call to a function that we absolutely don't know what it does because it's at the other end of God knows what, a pointer, right? I have no idea. I can't make any kind of reasoning about it. And so if we look at what this is doing here, I mean, I, I glossed over the code, but it's, you'd guessed it, it's just another std accumulate over a bunch of things, except I'm calling out to some structure that has a cost function for an, an, uh, an integer i. And so we're iterating over this thing, and we've got this giant vomit of code over here, <laughs> and we've got this, you know, the, all of the worst things, are, I mean, actually, I'm using the auto i over v, so we, we, it's not actually the worst it could possibly be, because if we were to iterate over it like we were doing before, then it would obviously have to assume that the v had changed again and do all that nonsense. And then in the middle of it all, we've got this big call indirect through keyword pointer of racks, and that's our virtual function call. And 
All right, I'm going to get on a bit of a soapbox here and sort of talk about this. Virtual function calls themselves aren't that expensive. CPUs are really, really, really clever at working out where the destination is, unless you're continually changing where it's pointing. And to, the, to a first approximation, the CPU can make a decent intelligent guess about where you're about to jump off to. And that's cool. The real expense comes from this barrier, this effective com compilation barrier that it represents. Like, again, the, like most of the time, even with, L, you know, you turn on LTO and my funny, you know, cool funk thing that I was doing before, it does discover it's pure and it goes, okay, cool, I can, I can start optimizing around it. Or, you know, you've got it in a header file if it's a trivial piece of code. But even if you've got it in a header file and you've implemented it and you've got 12 different implementations of cost strategies here, all in a header file, you know, the compiler has to assume it could be any of them and just jump out and, and call it. And then it doesn't know what they do. And even if it can prove the set of all um, implementations of Costa, there's always this, the, the, the thought that you could dynamically load something up that also implements Costa, and then you know any assumption it has might not be valid. So you know, it limits what cleverness can happen. But let's just see what happens if I were to invent a Costa right now. So obviously, at the moment, it's just calling keyword putter racks, and we're, we're on GCC here. Um, so I'm going to make a, oh, this is not easy to type, struct, uh, static Costa. And it's going to be int cost for, whoops, int x override, return x times x. So we're just, it, the, the cost of anything is its square. Uh, it's, oh, yeah, you see, always put override. And always put a semicolon, yeah, like her, her banged home at, um, at CPPCon. So now let's look what's happening here. Okay, so we're getting into the, the top of our loop here. Yeah, rubbish, 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 rubbish. We're going to look at L7 as a starting point, even though it's not actually that, um, it's not actually at the top of the loop. But we're reading a whole bunch of things out, and then there's this big comparison here. Oh, so where before we had a call through the virtual function pointer to who knows what, we are reading out where the virtual function was going to go to first. This is what this mov rdx, comma keyword putter rdx. So this is us reading out the v table. And this is reading out the zeroth entry in the v table here because I don't have a virtual destructor and no one shouted at me for that. I'm really surprised, but you know, <laughs> suits, it's, it's, it suits my purposes. Um, and so um, this is us reading out the address of where I would otherwise have called to when I did my virtual call. And the compiler's going, well, Heck, I, I've got a little bit of information about what's going on here. I know there's at least one implementation of static costa. How expensive it would it be for me to just see if this one happens to point at the one and only one I know about? Pretty cheap. I just read it out and I do a comparison. And, you know, the branch predictor will do its thing. And if I'm wrong every time or I'm right every time, it's pretty much free. And what happens if I'm right? So if the comparison with the where I was going to jump is actually the address of the very function that, that it knows about, this cost for in, in the static constant, we go to L11. Mm -hmm. And in L11, we've inlined that function and we're just carrying merrily on. So we've, oops, got that the wrong way around. So it's not free. And I'm not going to pretend that that's you know, not a potentially expensive thing to do anyway, especially as in the case where it wasn't equal to the thing that we were calling, we probably have to assume all bets are off again and recalculate a load of stuff. But the compiler has been smart enough here to say it's, it's cheap for me to do this and I can inline it. It's so cheap to inline it that the only extra overhead is reading the V table over and over again, reading where it points to over and over again in a comparison, which again is not bad. Yes, Peter. Your question for the compiler is about it. Why does it check the function and keep the remarks that you did yourself? So I, I think I know the answer to this. Um, <laughs> no, actually, I don't know the function. Oh, I, so the question was why does it check the um, function and not the V table itself? I think probably because it covers m more, you know, if multiple inheritances in, in place, or sorry, multiple things inherit from my costa, in the general case, if I compare the V table, I have potentially like 12 objects. And if none of them override uh, cost for themselves, but override other methods, then the thing I really care about is whether or not it's that function that's called, not whether it's a specific implementation of the whole class. There's a hand up at the back there. Yeah, adding final to the static so the answer, the question was adding final to the static costa. It's a very thi weird thing to say, isn't it? Final here, no changes here. Uh, Jason. Uh, I, I'm a little lost. Is it having to check this on every reiteration? It is. So that was a question I thought you, that Peter was going to ask. <laughs> so. And I wait for that. Yes, Marshall was waiting for it as well. So the, 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 the observation here is there is something here which is pretty damn constant, which is the, this Costa object, sorry, not constant, but we're using the same Costa object over and over and over again. 
and inside that cost object is a vtable, and inside that vtable is a pointer to a function, and we're every single time we're reading it through, and it's like this is the perfect kind of thing you'd expect a co compiler to look at and go, I'm going to hoist that out, and I'm going to do this check once, and once only, and then I could pick two different code paths. I could have the one that does the really cool thing with RDX and, 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 and all the craziness that is there, and I could do the one that just kind of calls through the virtual function every single time. It's one of those really dark corner cases of C++. It is, and I'm going to look at, at, the, at the faces here about where I, whether I'm going to say it right or not, because this is like the, the scariest place to mention and try and say anything about the standard. But it's completely, I believe it is valid to destruct yourself and placement new a different type of object that is uh, the same size as you in yourself. So you can do new parent this other type that conforms to my interface. I'm getting some nods here, so at least I'm mean, hand-wavingly in the right space. <laughs> Questions everywhere. Um, I'll go with you at the back. <laughs> yes, the other, the other uh, um, yes, uh, the observation there was that uh, the cost for inside the implementation of Costa could actually change what this Costa object is in some way. Yes, and Marshall? I'm wondering what happens if you add cons to cost for. So if I add cons to cost for, here, I, if I, my instinct is that const is never ever used for any kind of meaningful optimization ever, <laughs> sadly, as much as we want it to, because const can always be casted away, cast away. Uh, oh, here, yeah, const, but again, like, uh, yeah, exactly, it won't make any difference, but we can give it a go. Yeah, in fact, it's made no difference at all. So, I was trying to get Clang to do the same thing, because I know like Piotr has done some excellent work getting the devirtualizer and the speculative devirtualizing in LLVM, but I'm blowed if I can get the command line flags to do what I want to do. But Clang actually has a minus F, no strict V tables. I'm looking in this direction in case anyone's going to nod or smile. F strict V table pointers, which says, Scout's honor, I promise not to do that terrible, terrible thing where I muck around with the V tables. Is, is, is that the right? <laughs> Right. So the compilers are not taking advantage of that optimization because you know people are not using Lambda yet. Right. <laughs> so, so if you want to make if you want to tell your compiler you are allowed to take full advantage of what the language, uh, what the standard says, then <coughs> use a strict V table pointer and you'll see that. Okay. So the minus F strict V table pointers effectively gives the compiler license to take advantage of th what the standard sh already allows it to do. And there's something about stood launder, but everything I goes south when stood launder gets mentioned. It's only when I'm involved. So yeah. I'll, I'll pause it. There's an another hand up. Yeah. So uh, that's, that's the implications of your standard here. Um, doing that placement new over yourself is not uh, undefined by itself. But then any use of you as an object <coughs> that doesn't understand that your type changed and can see the new pointer of that represents that event thing. So if you use launder to, to for existing pointers to be recalculated with the knowledge of the new pointer. I see. So the observation there is that okay. So whereas I try to get out of talking about stood launder in any meaningful way, um, because if you if you do placement new yourself and change your dynamic type then any pointer that pointed at you using the old name is effectively un is invalid, and you'd have to use a stood launder to bring it back to being the new type or something of that. No, yeah, there's some nodding. I mean, like, this is hand wavy stuff, but uh, yes, yeah, so on the back there. Um, and this is going back to something you said, why doesn't he just catch the address of the new table? I think I remember Keith, correct me if I'm wrong, that there are a couple of corner cases where it can actually generate multiple copies of the V table for a class. Right, so the observation there that there might be, it might be possible to generate multiple copies of the vtable. I would hope the linker would do the same thing that it's doing to get rid of the multiple copies of the function that would presumably go alongside such a thing. <coughs> and with shared modules, there's, yeah, so the point there is like with DLLs and other things, shared objects, we might have problems. Was, was there any other hands up there? Oh, yeah, well, at the front, the John. Two and a half years ago, we did some experiments with allocators and templates to see to what extent the compilers would devirtualize if you had a monetized allocator followed by, let's say, a, 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 I don't know, a, a, some sort of a either node-based container or whatever. And <coughs> it turned out that on Clang, because the, the, the virtual functions of the derived uh, allocated type were inline, and the, and the client compiler could see that, and because Vector has all of its stuff in its header, and the compiler could see that, the code was identical to as if you had invaded the type and, 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 and inlined it all with the, the type parameter. In other words, the code was the same. For Clang, 
but not for uh, no for GCC. For GCC. Not for Klein. Sorry, I said it backwards. Yep. No worries. And what I wanted to ask is, to what extent has the de-virtualization on Klein improved Sarge Cloud with no longer being built? I, uh, so the, there were some questions about whether GCC is devirtualizer versus Clang devirtualizer. I, in my experience of using GCC predominantly, the, the GCC's devirtualization seems more mature, but I also know that, that the people are working on the Clang one, and I'm just annoyed I can't get it to work here. So if anyone has any ideas about what I might be doing wrong, or if, if someone is hastily getting a, a Compiler Explorer link together that might be able to demonstrate this, that would be cool. The, the um, point I wanted to make, though, was it wasn't that it was almost free. The devirtualization wasn't almost free. It was as if. Okay, so the observation here was that it was, although there was a virtual call, it could st there was one of those cases where it could be statically proven the type, and, and therefore the virtual calls vanished. And if I, w in fact, if I were to do that, if I were to take this um, class here and then do a, you know, int test, um, which takes a const vector, vector int amp v, and then I'm going to do a static costa here of c, and then I'm going to return total cost of c and v. But with this one up here, <coughs> I don't know if that will work. I mean, I'm just going to make it static for now, just to make it disappear. But so. Oh, uh, oh, well here it would do. Yes, if it knew it was a static costa, then if, especially as it's now final. So if we made to change it to a static costa in total cost and then made it final, the compiler would know that there's no one else who could possibly have implemented that, and it would take it away. It does. It, the com because it's final. Because it's final. It's final. Exactly right. So the yeah, the final there would be important if you were to pass it as a as a static costa yeah. here. So another thing I've observed along the way, so that you can see here now, this test thing is just in line the whole thing because we've we it, the compiler can is in line total cost and then it's gone. Well, I know the type of static costa, which is I think broadly the kind of thing you were talking about, John. Um, so another thing I've noticed, and now I'm just looking at time. We got we got time. We got time. It's all good. Um, is if this was all inside, it will set up name. No, that's not <coughs> how that works. Oh, yeah, so my auto, <laughs> I'm being defeated by my own auto um, <laughs> cleverness. All right, now you get to see what's hiding up there. OK, we're going to put this, all this stuff down here in an anonymous namespace and see what happens after that. So now we've got this total cost function. And it now, it, first of all, it's not going to generate the code because it knows that, well, no one else can see costa or static cons costa. So no one can pass it to total cost. So <laughs> no one's calling total cost. I can throw everything away. Hooray! <laughs> so, but if you can contrive examples where if the compiler can prove it's at least an implementation that's in an anonymous namespace, it means that it knows nobody else can see it and it can assume things about it. All right, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pause on that. Oh, there was a question at the front. I had one silly question based on something we were talking about before. Can we do anything with like attribute pure there? So the question was, like could we do anything about attribute, attribute pure? I honestly don't know in the context of anything other than like honky old C functions that I've oh. seen and along my, my, my travels. So okay. I'm afraid I don't know. <laughs> and and I, I, feel, I fear I'm going to get enough hate mail about using horrible compiler backdoors. <laughs> yes, Peter. I thought that this was a virtual function where if you go up an indirect jump, you can invoke target for the call. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, that's an excellent question. So the observation there, well, I'll try and do it while I'm talking. No, I, I'll try. <laughs> Whichever, one of the two things is that um, the indirect jump down here in the middle of the code, this call through a, a quad, quad word do that here, is an indirect pointer jump and is a subject of one of the many um, speculative execution <laughs> things in the spe spectre sort of style of things. If someone can tell me what the damn flag <laughs> is for GCC to turn it on, I would do it. Let me try. Anyone else uh, help? Oh, two helps, and then we need to. Oh, oh no! I've realised I broke that locally. Oh, you see, this is what happens if you use the one. Let me try and Google uh, Spectre mitigation GCC. Is that going to be what we're going to type into Google here? This is pr really professional, isn't it? When. Uh, uh, Aha. M. Indirect branch equals thunk. We're going to give that a go, and I'm too lazy to even type it myself. So we're going to do that, and we're going to go back over to here. And mindirect branch equals thunk. Uh, does anyone else pronounce things like, you know, fin line and yes, good, yes. Um, <laughs> it's the only way. Um, fun roll, yeah, the fun roll loops. <laughs> there we go. So, 
So now we have uh, exactly as we we're now doing a, an indirect thunk, which has a very, very interesting and cool and definitely worth reading up and seeing how it works, although it's sad that we need to do it. Um, implementation. I don't know if it's actually in the file. Does it emit it in everywhere? Yeah. Oh, look at that. Look at this, this magical thing here of stack smashing and other all the worst <laughs> things, you know. But the compiler's doing it. It's allowed to. Again, it's allowed to make some assumptions about that. <laughs> OK, right. Oops. And you can see all the people using combined. Oh, that's all sorts of things going on there that, that I wasn't planning on showing everyone just yet, at least. OK, so we've done virtual methods. I think that's it on uh, the new material. And we have 18 minutes left. So, um, you know, as before, what has my compiler done for me? Absolutely tons of things. It's just, again, it's, it's amazing. We may complain about long build times. We may complain about error messages. There are many things we may complain about, but just take a moment to think about the engineering marvel that is a modern compiler and what goes on inside the optimizer. And if you even, so uh, actually let's go back and while I'm, oh, no, up, there you go. I don't have to use this thing. Um, so some of the other things that people, so I don't write all of Compiler Explorer anymore, so I don't actually know how to use it really, apart <laughs> from the bits that I know. But we can have a look at some of the output from GCC here and just look at, these are all of the passes that are running on your code when you compile it, and I don't even understand what the, I'm going to do some of these. Like, and you get like, here you are, this is what happens in that particular pass. This is what the code looked like as far as GCC was concerned at that point. And it's like mind boggling, absolutely mind boggling. And again, if I was remotely qualified to be talking to you about this kind of thing, I would say some more things. Um, similarly, we've got the equivalent on Clang. Um, we've got the, we can see the AST from Clang, which might be useful if you want to actually like try and work, but I mean like as was shown in one of the lightning talks last night, it's really just a giant vomit of information that if you, is pro may be useful if you have a real problem, but I don't understand. Um, we've got an optimization output here, so Clang I, um, can give some information about um, why it did or did not optimize stuff. I mean, well there's some analysis sort of like annotations. Um, so I don't really know what that is doing, but if, if you know what those things are, it's ho past the hoisting bit cast, which sounds like a kind of, oh yeah, Titus knows what those things are. <laughs> oh, you've got a question. Oh, yeah. I believe you. <laughs> Right. So, so, so I didn't know that this was a thing that you were saying, and I'm chatting my team right now to say, hey. <laughs> 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 All right, live updating the Google oh, team. Right. And the other thing you need to know is S restrictions, because right. that's how you write magic. Right, right. So, so the observations there were that if you were going to be using like Clang tooling, and you know, like, so, so Titus is um, um, excellent, like keynote at uh, CPUCon was all about the live at head and the fact that they're. Google are using like these really cool methods for like re um, refactoring code using Clang tooling. And <laughs> if you're going to write anything that uses Clang tooling to do some kind of refactoring, this is the kind of thing you're going to need to have to understand. And so um, you can come and see it in Compiler Explorer if you wish. Um, yeah. What else have we got on there while we're talking about this? So yeah, we've got graph output as well. So we, uh, um, we uh, this is not a particularly interesting one, but we've got like a, a, an early-ish version of uh, like an AST viewer. Well, not even early. This is pretty cool. I, I, I'm, again, I haven't played with it all that much, but you can kind of see what's going on with an AST. If you, uh, not, uh, CFG control flow graph, and you know we'd like to add more um, visualizations like this. Visualizations are awesome, I and mean, we think we've there've been some various talks about this. Um, there was one I was going to do, and I think I've remembered what it is now. Um, I'm going to go back a few slides. Oops, no. To yeah, let's get the let's get the fast, the better max array thing. This was something that landed only the other day. So Clang MCA, which sounds like some kind of song that I should be doing some kind of dance to, or LLVM MCA. <laughs> it's fun to use. The, uh, is now a pseudo language, I think, called analysis, and we get to do things like paste in a code snippet into it from assembly pick the one and only LLVM machine code analyzer, which I didn't realize it was called, and then this is not going to show up well at all. And definitely we would love to get a much better visualization with like pictures and graphs and things. You can see the same kind of thing that Intel's um, uh, analyzer does. This is, but this is coming from LLVM's internal understanding about how the, the, sh the scheduling happens on the particular uh, CPU that you're on and how it's 
trying to move things around. It's awesome. My favorite bit, though, is to put minus timeline in here. And this is the bit I really want to do a visualization for. And now I'm getting very excited. Um, is to see it like a simulated run through. So here are all the instructions coming in. Time is going from left to right in clock cycles. And so you can see on the first clock cycle, the CPU decoded four instructions. That's four instructions. And you know how complicated that is. It's amazing. <laughs> and then the first one, this, von, this was executing straight away. E. Um, the second one, because it used the results of the first one, took a little, you know, took a couple of cycles before it could start executing. And then this one here, which is what the vmov upd of the end, which is like writing the result of the whole thing out. Well, it had to wait right until the end. So it was stalled during this time. But luckily, the add instruction here for the racks 32, that could happen straight away. And it executed, and it was done. Like, we're done, we're an add. But it couldn't retire until everything else had finished. This is like, this is your spectre window of vulnerability kind of area for speculative execution. So now we're just carrying on doing all this kind of stuff. And you can see, like, well, look, there's one clock cycle, two clock cycle, three clock cycles. Look how much work is being done on that machine. It's amazing. <laughs> anyway, I'd love to see that, um, like, visualized pretty, like, nicely with, like, you know, Jason. Well, I, I don't know if you can answer, like, I'm sure not, you know, working for Intel or anything, but how is it, how is it able to start executing the second instruction before it has the results from the first instruction? So the question was, how is it able to start executing the um, second instruction before it has the results from the first instruction? I don't know <laughs> at all. I imagine magic pixies come and come <laughs> from the future and give the, no, I don't know. I'm guessing that there's some kind of um, microcoding of this particularly wide YMM thing and it, maybe some of the results start coming out early. I, I, I don't know, I don't know. Um, and this is obviously, this is Clang's internal representation. We want to put Intel's version as well once I've kind of worked through the license um, and made sure I can do it. And then it has a very similar view and it's, it disagrees completely with this particular view <laughs> in many cases. <laughs> And it's also wrong, it's demonstrably wrong in some cases. So I mean, like, th like it, it's so complicated. And I mean, I have to say, like, y my other hobby is writing emulators in JavaScript for old 8-bit machines. And it has not escaped my notice that I could combine all of my hobbies in one by writing the perfect uh, x86 emulator that then emulates your code with all pictures and like, here's the instruction queue and everything. But I don't have, I've got some time off. I'm between jobs at the moment, but I don't have that much time <laughs> off. But if anyone wants to pay me loads of money to do that, then, you know, talk to me after this. <laughs> All right. Sorry, John, I was going to let you uh, take a picture. All right, we're done. So what has my compiler done for me lately? A lot. We have 11 minutes left, and I think I've already covered all of uh, enough interesting and cool things that the compiler does. Go look at CppCon video, because there are some really, really, really cool ones. Clang in <laughs> particular. So is that a question or an observation? Yeah, um, in the CppCon video, somebody mentioned to me that there was actually JavaScript x86 Kind of Correct, yes. And I just wanted to know, check it out. Right, so the, the, the question was, um, at CppCon someone pointed out that there was a, a, an x86 uh, emulator already for um, JavaScript, and have I checked it out? The answer is, no, I haven't. I mean, I, I can see the shape of like a, an emulator, and an emulator is very, very, very easy in comparison to doing a, like a, 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 a block-level simulator with all of the things that come with it. But it would, it would open the door to maybe, to maybe to execute in the browser, although that hides a lot of like the stuff that's happening in underscore underscore main and all the kind of things that aren't, I'm not actually showing. So, but maybe some kind of symbolic -y type execution would be interesting. <laughs> so yeah, good point though. And you know, again, more time is needed and maybe, yeah. Less sleep, less, sleep, less time with my family. Um, so this is how it works. This is, uh, the <laughs> this is not how it works. This is though, this is one of the servers that, um, it was the original host for the public version of, um, there's two servers here. This one's not even plugged in. It's this one here that's upside down. Um, you can blame Comcast for why it's there um, in my basement. Um, so yeah, for a long time, it ra well, for a long time, for a, for a couple of weeks it ran on that before it became obvious that this was a ridiculous idea of letting my, my home like, file server run this stuff when all havoc, havoc can break loose. So I moved to AWS, and I'm embarrassed to say that there are still one or two cron jobs that run on this box that really need to be moved <laughs> somewhere else, but you know, so. But yes, it run, it's written in Node, it runs on Amazon. Um, uh, it, the code looks not very far away from this, you know, instantiate a web server, this is what I want you to do if you get a, a request here and then you fork a c compiler and pass it some options and it's all pretty straightforward stuff. And the obvious question is why haven't I written this in C++? Um, and it, given that one of my other projects is a web server in C++, it does, would seem like an obvious thing to do, but I don't know, there's just something about the sheer amount of text manipulation I have to do <laughs> and the quick turnaround time. Um, 
So as I say, it runs on Amazon EC2. There's all these bits and pieces. You know, we've got caches and load managers, load balancers, and I, I fire up instances on demand. And thanks to my lovely, lovely Patreon su supporters, I can now actually have quite a few instances up and running anyway all the time. And I, um, so hopefully you will never notice that it takes that long, and the queuing for like um, for your your compiles is never that that bad. Um, there's some Docker stuff going on behind there. I can bore you to tears with all of this stuff. Um, but ultimately, I, I was talking with somebody earlier about like, you know, Docker seems like the obvious thing to do. You know, like, to, hey, Docker with yeah, um, you know, all the compilers in it, and then you could just run the one Docker image. But it turns out 254 compilers take up quite a lot of space, about 80 gig. Um, <laughs> and building a Docker image that has an operating system, node, and all the things that need to run with it, and 80 gig of compilers is no mean feat. And worse still, it's like when you fire up the Amazon instance, like, oh, load is increased fire up a new e EC2 instance, it fires up and it goes, what's the first thing I have to do? Oh, I need to get 80 gig of Docker um, thing, and then I have to start, and then by that time, the EC2 thing goes like, this guy's not responding to me, I'm killing him and trying another one. <laughs> it's not, a, and then you can configure the timeouts and whatever, um, and then you can sort of pre-build the Docker image into the virtual machine image, and then you've got a 120 gig virtual machine image that takes like 24 hours to actually produce on EC2 and copy to all the nodes, which means that when someone says, can you add my new compiler, I'm going to put, or my new library, can you put it in tomorrow? You're like, I can put it in now, and you can see it in three days' time, and that's not, that stuff's not cool. So I used the oldest trick in the book of just the shared NFS drive with all the compilers on it, and it's terrible, it's slow, it's one of the reasons why some of the hetero libraries don't compile very, very quickly. It's not because the compiler is slow, it's because the I.O. is so, so slow. And I tried layers of caching on that, but caching for file <laughs> systems on NFS, I don't know, it doesn't seem to be a very solved problem in a way that, that works well. So that's still room for improvement. I'm still experimenting potentially with having like one, a throwaway drive which just gets r-synced um, from like a, uh, another image and, and uh, start up and hopefully like the delta is not too big if I've you know, upgraded a few compilers or whatever and then I can periodically do like a rebuild or whatever but it's a lot of work and investment it doesn't like really have any sort of forward-facing um, improvements for, for my fine customers. Um, yeah, it looks like this. It's, there's a whole bunch of stuff. I've got like an administration node now because I'm, I'm, I'm slowly but begrudgingly moving towards allowing you, you crazy kids to run your code on my, my servers. And in order to do that, I need to make sure I can lock down all the servers, which means that each of the nodes needs to have absolutely no access to anything ever, which means that I can't log into them and do anything anymore unless I go through like the one distinguished node that's like, you are the admin node. You get all the permissions in the world. Everyone else gets nothing. And then, so I've had to do some moving bits and pieces around. Um, the compilers themselves are built through Docker images. Who went to the Docker compiler -y talk? Yeah, very similar to that. That was great. It was, I've, I've mailed, um, oh, what was his name? Jason, Jason, yeah. And um, hopefully he can help me for to make my Docker images suck less. Um, so the, op the important thing about this, the take, take home from this part, is that the open source <laughs> compilers that you find on Compiler Explorer right now are available to you if you use any kind of even remotely modern Ubuntu. Git, git clone the compiler explorer image repo, and there's a single sh bash file in update compilers. You run that, and if, as long as you've got about 65 gig of spare hard disk on slash opt slash compiler explorer, you're going to get all of the compilers that are free dumped in there, and you can just run them. That's how compiler explorer works. They're just, they're just in slash opt compiler explorer. And that's how I test locally. That's how I had them all on my laptop, is I just ran it. And like, this is a brand new laptop. Um, I sync down the stuff and I run it. And, and to run this, the, oh, that's the security. We'll come back to that in a second on the golden layer, whatever. Yeah, this is important, right? You should be able to clone, git clone, compiler explorer, and type make. And if it doesn't just work, you need to email me because that's so important to me that people can just grab code and use it and not have to fart around with too many things. It should install Node. It should install the other weird package managers and things that hide behind the scenes and put something like a little dot file inside that directory. And then it's like, you're good to go. <laughs> And that's how it should be. And so if you have sensitive code and you don't want to be sending it across the network to, to me and you don't want to like take my word for the fact that I'm not reading and laughing at all of your code, then you know run a local instance. If you've got your own compiler, run a local instance. If you want to um, do minus I, capital I, and give the path to your current project so that you can do hash include my header file.h and then just do a targeted test to see what would happen if you were to do something with it, run a local instance. It's really, really easy and, and, and pretty simple to do. And if it isn't, let us know. Titus. And a minor additional tip, just for like good community writing, uh, I would really like the whole community to start moving more towards something like Dockerized containers uh, for their compilers, because I think it is horrifying that the majority of their build is not good. So, oh, sorry, carry on. Like when We've got like five. Absolutely. Yeah. Life is so much easier. 
Absolutely. So Titus's point is like Dockerizing conf compilers is just an awesome thing to do. Um, I agree with that, and you know, it, it, I think it shows that like well, ten years ago when I was at Google, like the thing I uh, the most the thing I missed as soon as I left Google was that hermetic build system where I just type make and I get the compiler that then builds everything and or, or the equivalent, the Google equivalent, and that's awesome. And I I, I seek to um, rep reproduce that wherever I've worked since because it's just so nice to be able to do. Um, all right, what did I miss over here? We've got like four minutes. Yeah, turns out a compiler is a giant security hole waiting to happen. Nobody really like cares about whether there's a buffer over front of the compiler unless it actually causes a crash in a meaningful piece of code that you actually wrote yourself. So I have to try my best. So they run inside a Docker container. And as I move towards execution, I'm going to end up with a slightly different solution for that, which again, I don't have time to go into. I've got this really, really pansy thing with LD preload where I try and check the compiler and see which files it's actually opening up. And then, and then I'll like deny access to certain things. But it turns out modern compilers open up proc self, they open up et cetera password to do, you know, all the things that you think are like bad stuff. They, it's like a get UID type thing, I think. It, you know, like the, you know, the system behind the scenes gets, I, it happened once and I was like, oh, I'm not going to think about it anymore. And I just put it into the whitelist. And then at that point, I realized that half of my compilers are statically built anyway. So I can't LD preload the things anyway. So I mean, but it runs inside Docker. I mean, about once every six weeks, someone emails me and goes, ha ha, hash include, et cetera, password. I can see your et cetera, password, ha. And I'm like, yeah. I mean, that hasn't been a security hole for like 22 years or so, as far as I can remember. If you get shadow, I'd be a bit more worried. But again, it's the login into a system which doesn't really exist. It's a Docker container that is, is its own little world. So, you know, you, you go knock yourself out. That's great. But um, <laughs> now, in fairness, there are problems with this because you could delete files. If you can find a way to delete files with the compiler, then you can start to like do a DOS type attacks on me. But don't, don't do that. Yes, this is right. Um, the Microsoft compilers, I'm sort of going backwards here. Microsoft compilers are, are, are installed through unzipping things from like backdoored found VC Azure dog fooding website that somebody gave me once. Um, and then they run under Wine because I, this does run under Windows. So um, it, it does run under Windows and Microsoft are offering me help in terms of getting like more native Windows type support into uh, Compiler Explorer. And Compiler Explorer has always been able to like delegate to another instance of Compiler Explorer, like through that API, it kind of pull, calls out to the other guy and says, hey, uh, what compilers have you got? And then it'll like front them and, and, and proxy them. So um, I can run a Windows instance somewhere else that's doing the Windows compilers and that would be the best idea. But as I've not really even used the Windows op operating system for like getting on for 20 years myself, I'm not really the best person to set up a secure instance of a <laughs> system that's going to run arbitrary pieces of code that someone else is doing. <laughs> Doesn't seem like a good idea. I know my limits. Um, yeah, the front end, no one cares about. Microsoft has taken down their online compiler. So the observation was Microsoft have taken down their online compiler. Right, yeah, so who knows why that was and who knows. But um, yeah, running locally is easy. Y usage, oh. This was something I put in right at the end. Yay, so this is the usage over time. This is like weeks, um, compiles per week. So this is when you get on Hacker News for the first time and you hit like, what, a million a week. But you know, we're, we're, we're here about 600,000 compiles a week. It's quite impressive. And obviously, I can make that go up really easily by changing the default delay between you finishing typing and me starting to compiling. And then I get more and more compiler errors and my stats go up. But it's not a great metric. There's a question at the back there. Uh, what's that period of time where it's like zero for like a month? Uh, this bit here is Godbolt made a mistake. The, the, this Godbolt, not the site Godbolt. Um, I can't actually remember what it was now, but yeah, for a while it wasn't logging some things. I mean, I got the Google Analytics stuff is that, but this is like from scraped from my own logs. Um, yeah, I mean, I love the fact that Compiler Explorer was made to scratch my own itch, which is like, I want to see what the compiler's doing. Isn't it cool? And yet, I've been seeing it used as like a general code paste bin. Um, I know that compiler developer people like to use it as a quick sort of turnaround for, for what they're doing. It's, I've, I've seen people using it as a C++ REPL. I think uh, Matt Calabrese says he uses it as a, like an online calculator, which is like the daftest thing I've ever heard, but I love it. That's just <laughs> Matt for you. Um, and probably the thing that I'm most happy about is, is hearing from people who do training and saying, this is a really good way to help us teach people what's happening under the hood of the compiler. And that really warms my heart because, you know, we need to teach people what's going on. And this is what I love the most. There's a, that's what, oh, so there was a, a thank you, Zach, yeah. Yeah, so, um, yeah, coming soon, execution support. Mm. And uh, I want to say thanks to all the people. It's not just me that does this. I'm glad to say that I have Patreon supporters and I have um, a active contributors. R Ruben is probably the biggest contributor. He's, he's awesome. And then there's a whole raft of other people who, do, who, who help me out. And please, pull requests are welcome. Hang out on the Compiler Explorer or the... Compiler Explorer uh, uh, developers chat room on Slack and ask questions. Um, I need all the help. There's a question over there though from, from yeah, somebody who just jumped in. Tell you about my use cases and winning arguments with my coworkers. 
Ah, oh, yes. That is actually... I have several people have said that that's their favourite use. So the, the observation there from, from Bryce was like, it's, it's an argument winner. Someone goes, that doesn't, it, that, that can't do that. And you're like, ah. <laughs> the little Godbolt link later, you're like, oh yeah, it's just returned. Oh, I, I just called it Godbolt. Oh dear. <laughs> 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 I'm thinking of changing my name to Matt Compiler Explorer. Do you think that would work? <laughs> all right. So, and thanks to you all for here for listening to me for the last 90 minutes. And yeah, go read some assembly and thank your compiler developers. They really do an amazing job. Thanks, everyone. We're out of time.